we've got the rock star, Antoine Bryant, that is the moderator for us today. So director of planning for the city of Detroit. Welcome, Antoine. We have John Jordan, who is the design director for Gensler Detroit uh, with us in person today. Hello. Uh, we have Nate, that's the principal at MVVA that's going to be joining us virtually today. And Winka Doubledom, founder and partner. Um, oh, we got, we got lots of good things going on. So um, founding partner uh, of Architectonics New York, Miller Professor and Chair Weitzman Architecture, Director of Advanced Research and Innovation at the University of Pennsylvania. That's one busy lady. <laughs> so we have a uh, two virtual uh, panelists and two in person. So Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, been a great time already. I'm glad that everybody had a great time at lunch. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully we'll keep you awake during lunch. We know how that goes when you're the session right after lunch. We're very excited to be here. Uh, Ivana gave me the, the pleasure of engaging with this phenomenal uh, group of panelists and also the uh, world's longest title for a session. So we're excited to get started <laughs> with that. You get a prize if you get to say it quickly three times in a row. But one of the things we want to talk about when we think about process thinking, right? We talked in an earlier conversation about the end result that we often see is one that we all can agree with and we're all very excited about, but it's the process as a designer where the richness uh, comes into play. And we've got three phenomenal designers that have been involved in projects across the world. Uh, and we're going to hear a little bit about how their process gets us to some of the results that we're all familiar with and we're all seeing. I uh, wanna be able to, I'm gonna go with my, my buddy John here, since uh, he's right next to me, but we're definitely gonna get to our online people. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited, Winka has a bunch of books that she all read yesterday, clearly. So I'm really excited by uh, her panel. If you're an academic, you have to have a bunch of books behind you. Uh, but one of the things, when we talk about, John, what's your practice and what you've been doing both here in the States and in overseas. Um, how would you define uh, the ability of process thinking to really push where we can go as a society from a design standpoint? Well, I think when we consider process, especially in, in the realm of urban urbanism, it's really, you know, how do we start with engagement mm -hmm. and how do we, you know, bring in, uh, you know, obviously when you're doing a building, there's there's an owner, there's other folks involved, uh, consultants, but I think it's also what what does it mean to the city is an important question to ask. And I think the way we work is we always ask ourselves, you know, try to define what the purpose of a project is, both from a from an ownership standpoint, of course, but also what it means to the city and to the community. And then how do we unfold those and make sure that that our that our um that we're understanding and listening to all of those constituencies and kind of finding mm -hmm. the common points so we can establish a framework where everyone is, is, is working together towards a common goal. So you're working as a, a key part of a team. Uh, I've heard you talk about partnering, which I think is gonna be incredibly important as we draw from everyone here. Uh, very diverse firms that we have uh, in, this, in this space. And so they're all actively looking to push uh, developments in their respective cities. Uh, what I really would love to hear more about from, from Nate, uh, the work that your team is doing is, is designed, but also from the landscape stand part of it. And I think we looked <coughs> about how integral uh, landscape design is in a development and why it's not necessarily an adjunct, but really an integral part of the design landscape. So Nate, talk and tell us more about how that all integrates into pushing a city forward. I mean, a landscape or, and I think, I think we probably can expand that to just the notion of public realm. Mm -hmm. um, process is kind of the bedrock of kind of our, kind of our conversation that we have with people who will actually be using these and taking over these spaces in the future. So to us, process thinking is how do we, how do we make everyone uh, welcome and how do we invite a city that we're working in to be participants in that process? And I think if we don't kind of start there and have kind of that level of, of, of comfort, um, the end product kind of begins to break down. So 
And I think a, another big piece of that too is just is making sure that we include all voices in those conversations. And I mean, we can't we can't hold design as precious as a designer um, because really the design, I mean, we may carry the pencil or push the, you know, the, the, the computer strokes, but the process is for everybody. Well, you know, it's, it's funny, Nate, I, I appreciate you, first of all, uh, for we're clearly in the same age group when you say we're pushing the pencil, right? Because that's a, <laughs> a whole different discussion there. That's but, right. But, uh, that's a good point. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Winka, I can tell you were nodding during this conversation. You wanted to jump in there. And so I can't have a process question without asking our academics. So please jump in there as an academic and a practitioner about where you stand on this as well. Yeah, and I, I really love this discussion because, you know, it's, it's, it is true, like as a blur or as a hybrid between academics and, um, and practice, usually it's actually quite separated, right? Like you, you do one thing in academics and the other thing in practice. But we once had a question, and, and actually Nate made me think of that, mm -hmm. um, where a cl client came and asked us to do a bottom-up proposal for downtown Bogota in Colombia. And it was exactly based on that, that master plans typically fail there because the government is um, too short in power to actually execute them. Mm. So they had done multiple master plans, all failed. And we have kind of the same thing happening here. So he was working with the middle class to fundraise for a gigantic set of skyscrapers that actually uh, completely overfunded, funny enough, you would think how you do that, right, with, with, with normal people. The people were so um, excited that something would happen downtown and also because banks are super un unreliable there and maybe here since uh, 2008, um, they like to invest in buildings. So that building was within seconds funded. Um, and then he realized you couldn't just put two skyscrapers in a downtown. It essentially was pretty much deserted. Um, as our, many of our downtowns are, right? I was in St. Louis the other day and it's quite shocking. I was there as a kid traveling through the US and it was a booming uh, city. And then I came back and suddenly downtown was empty with two gigantic stadiums in it. Um, and that's a problem because what do we do with empty downtowns? So what I loved about his question is that it made us really um, think how, if you can't trust a master plan, what you do. And we developed this bottom-up plan that really uh, studied downtown um, in great detail, looked at where, where either the good, very good or very bad things were and developed five kind of acupunctures that were in the end um, designs because we, we have that tool as, as architects and urban planners. Um, but we only would propose these to the client if we felt they had three to five amazing feedback loops or spin-offs. So one example was we realized that commuting in and out of downtown was a huge mess, right? It's like you go from eight lane road into a two lane road and then um, there's 33 schools and universities and everyone lives far, far away up, up to four hours driving. So um, one thought was to take all the empty um, office buildings, make them into micro housing, um, and then have the students and or faculty or both um, live downtown, which eliminated a million um, commuters a day, believe it or not, um, mm -hmm. that reduced then the pollution, the traffic jam and everything with it. That was one spin-off, well, two in a way, right? It reduced traffic and pollution. And then the third one was that it would start to stimulate all the retail and restaurants and libraries and other things for downtown. So that's how we, I'm not going to mention them all, but that's how we work through it. And um, I thought it was really interesting because the difference between uh, just building a master plan and this is that you cause economic, social and cultural growth as well as do a building or a plan for that area. So the the and I that's what I liked what Nate was saying. So the idea that you don't just build a building, but you really start to think what is it that the middle class needs, which is something we completely ignore in this country, as far as I'm concerned. I'm from Holland. We have only middle class, and everyone has something to say, as you know, that's very <laughs> opinionated. Uh, so I think here it's just too little. You know, we need to talk more to the middle class, and we need to get into what they really need. 
That's that's fascinating. First of all, you know, if you have a funder that's looking for some buildings to put money into, I might know a few, right? So tell me, send, send them my way. I'd love to have a conversation. Uh, but also, I think your closing point about really supporting more here in the States, what our middle class is doing, uh, yeah. is definitely an argument we've heard quite a bit. Uh, you know, there's definitely been a, a growth in the wealth disparity in this nation, right? And so the middle class, many would say, is disappearing, and you have the, the very rich and you have the very poor. And that's, that's a uniquely uh, American dynamic that we're not correcting yet, right? So that's something that uh, we will uh, eventually begin to either fix or it's going to be the death knell of, this, of us uh, coming soon. But we're, we're talking about developing the city. We're talking about it. what do we do to really develop a city? And part of it, and each of you touched upon, and I want to really pull into it more, is defining what urban space is. And is urban space the place of the public realm, as Nate was referring to earlier? Is it where the buildings are? Or is it where people actually populate and congregate or some other thing, right? And so, you know, John, you're next to me, so you get all the questions, right? So, but one of the things, uh, how are we defining public spaces? And is that the first place we should go and think about as we develop a city? Or is that part of a larger ecosystem, right? Which way do you think makes more sense as we are pushing to develop our cities? Well, I think it's interesting to use the word ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's when we talk about sustainability or even moving beyond that, it should be kind of we're moving beyond that mm -hmm. and thinking about resiliency, building resiliency within, within our communities, within our cities. It's really the space uh, sorry to use this, <laughs> not to use interstitial, but, but it's the space between all of us, yeah, I think, absolutely. that makes a city. It's it's really, you know, the space that we're sharing here today. This is this is what should be happening. It's, an, it's a forum. We're all building the city together and should be a part of that conversation. So how do you do that? I think it's it's sometimes it's about finding the right partners within the city. Um, you know, for example, in L.A., you know, we we took a um, you know, there was a grant to do sustainable housing. Mm -hmm. We went to a partner that does uh, moderate to low income housing in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And then we also, you know, found public la or land that was owned by a by a local church. And none of those people were talking to each other. Right. But bringing them all to the table under this common cause, you know, is something that's influencing. So, again, those are constituencies in a city that can be a part of a, a bigger goal. You know, uh, and I think that's another thing that cities need to do is sort of have kind of hairy, audacious goals to define themselves and also uh, to promote to promote that bond between each other. We need, you know, cities need a fan base, mm -hmm. just like anything else. They need to be, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I came back. I'm a big fan of, of Detroit and um, it's, um, you know, that's what, that's what cities need. They need that power between everybody to come together on, on a topic, on what urban space is, what it, what it needs to be. Nate, I know you've got some ideas that, that are very close to John. Uh, I will let you know that everyone in the audience, uh, you get a, a bonus if you can use interest Interstitial in a sentence and making sense. <laughs> so uh, you know, if you drop that, that's okay too. But Nate, let's see. About, I, about I mean, it, well. it would it would date myself, but I feel like I I overused the term interstitial when I was <laughs> in graduate school. So I've, I've tried to park that one. Um, <laughs> no, I I just I think I want to just kind of riff off of like what you sure. were saying in that. Do you begin with kind of thinking about public realm in the city? Mm -hmm. As a landscape architect, I would love to say yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think basic needs need to be met first, and we're not. I mean, because the way cities have developed and kind of been shaped over the last fifty years, those basic needs are not being equitably met. So, but I think if you, so they need to be met first, but I do think that, that the public realm is where cities come together. And I think it's where we all learn from each other. If it's through direct conversation or just rubbing shoulders with someone that doesn't look like you. So I, to me, the public realm is, is kind of how we make the cities a better place, not just kind of with kind of our built environment, but socially. Mm -hmm. um, but also kind of the notion of audacious goals. I think um, my profession tends to be very pragmatic often, um, maybe maybe to a fault at some times, um, but those audacious goals kind of also instill, I think, a sense of civic pride, which 
which I think we, so we can't like completely park those for like pragmatic um, goals of city making. Um, so again, again, I'll, I'll kind of be back and I'll beat the drum of, of public, of public realm and kind of all the kind of incarnations that it, that it kind of takes on in the city. Nate, I appreciate that. I want Wink, I want Winka to respond, but I'm going to throw her a minor curveball uh, because we've heard from John, we've heard from Nate, uh, this notion of equitable uh, ad allocation of space, right? Uh, and what I want us to begin to really, really, you know, peel it back. How are we defining that, right? If we're going to focus on a public realm, if we're going to further focus on developing our cities, if we even have to ask the question of equitable space, that automatically means there's inequity, right? So how do we address uh, the definition of equitable space? Thank you for that easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, I was thinking when you were all talking, it's like really comes back to public commons, right, where um, where we, in theory, make spaces for everyone. Um, one of the things that, that hit me when I was living in New York, I came in the 90s, you know how New York was in the 90s. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> And then I remember at some point they made this, um, well, the idea was that we were going to get a park on the west side, but the beginning was a little uh, rubber red strip that was a bicycle path. That was the first thing they installed. And that little strip became the huge equalizer. Everyone was on it with rollerblades, with mm. dogs, walking, bicycles. We talked to each other. We had fun, we stopped everywhere. There was nothing else yet, right? That little strip changed the city. And I think we sometimes underestimate how one little thing can really change the city because it is the one thing we needed. And that was something in New York's case, something on the water, right? We had nothing on the water. We had Central Park if you wanted to live on the Upper West or East Side, which you know most of us don't. Um, and then you have nothing, right? So that little strip became really how you went. For example, I would go bicycle there, go up to a meeting and bicycle in. So you would always take the strip to go to meetings or whatever. So that, that's, I think, a first. But then I think also you want to um, extend public comments to uh, schools, schoolyards, police stations, administrative buildings, and all the other things, which for some reason, are all looking like we are uh, East Germany uh, <laughs> at best, right? Like the, I remember the last time I went to a police station was to do my fingerprints for my green card, which is many years ago. But it was just, I was in shock. I was like, how can anyone work here apart from breathe here? It was disgusting. And, you know, sadly that is still the case, right? Like you don't have to be in a city that is a bit more challenged like Detroit, we have the same exact problem in Washington, in New York, in LA, everywhere. Like, so we, in this country, I think we don't take care of public comments because a lot of it is private or we think private money should take care of it instead of thinking this is for all the citizens to use. So a mayor who is actually often more powerful than anyone really should take care of public comments. And, and if it was, it would automatically also be available to everyone. So I think these kind of, like, you know, like look at the schools, they have barbed wire around the schoolyard. Mm -hmm. Who, which kid can grow up to be a normal thinking person playing mm -hmm. in barbed wire? Mm -hmm. We think it's normal here, right? In any other country, that's a prison, right? So yeah. it's, it's just yeah. the language of it is mm -hmm. just, beyond you could just put a hedge around it and hide the barbed wire inside or something mm -hmm. i mean there are very simple solutions to a lot of these things to go back to my bicycle path but i think um there is no attention for it here and it's it's really sad and i often wish someone would invite me i would do I offer this here publicly. I will pro bono design a police station if you want me to. <laughs> I there can't stand it anymore. You're not going to hurt it. It's being live streamed and everything. Yeah. Wink has said it. <laughs> because this, this is recorded. <laughs> well, no, I think you're making a valuable point, right? I mean, the, the, the availability for 
designed to be applied equitably is something that does not have to be hard. It becomes a decision. It needs champions, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like we have a room full of champions here, but I was joking with John earlier uh, after our interstitial comment uh, that we need to uh, diversify this room. Right. Yeah. Because we're to many respects, you know, we're, we're all preaching to the proverbial choir to convert it. So how do we take this conversation of process thinking of uh, growing our uh, cities and furthering them? And how do we make it outside of this room? Right. How do we get the people that can pull the levers uh, to understand this and to appreciate it? Right. And so I already heard John. I'm going to get back to John on that one. But, uh, you know, Winka and Nate, I want to hear your responses specifically to that. And then John's going to close us out because he has all the right answers. <laughs> no pressure there. How do we how do we grow in the room? Nate, go ahead. Um, I think you have to rely on groups of people who are already working to make change in a city. And I, I mean, I think a, an example of that from, for, from our work in Detroit was just being introduced to the Bog Center. And then all of a sudden, these networks of people that are, you know, they spend, they spend every hour out of every day, you know, trying to like, make the conversation more diverse and bring people into the fold that that um that weren't there before and you know a lot of times as designers we think like we want to do we want to kind of control like the public process and we want to kind of we think we can like make the narrative more interesting but we really have to kind of back off a bit and and be willing to uh, have conversations that maybe aren't comfortable and you may hear suggestions about things you should include in a in a project that you don't want to hear but we have to so you have to be able to kind of be willing to listen and and learn from the folks around you or folks that are already trying and then we kind of we help build that network and I think as designers we can do that we can help build the network um a lot of times it's hard for us to start it. Yeah. Winka? Yeah, I think I've seen a few models work and one was where city planning would ask young architects and developers, the opposites, right? <laughs> um, to come in for a brainstorm and to actually make actionable plans that are funded and that are going to be executed. Um, I think there's a huge group of young architects that absolutely no chance in anything here in our cities. It's the same four or five architects that get invited for everything. And it is a, a missed chance, I think, because there are amazing young architecture offices that could do a lot of work and would help the city think through a lot of issues. For, you know, brainstorms probably for free work for a reasonable fee rather than the huge overhead of big offices. And I think it's underused. And the reason why I'm saying that is not to bring uh, Colombia all the time up, but it was the most impressive thing I've ever seen is where, as you know, it has very poor regions. And um, I was the jury, one of the jury members for a Biennale where they gave an award to projects and they actually made us travel from project to project in the, the final list of 10. And I realized traveling through there that um, they would put a beautifully designed school in the middle of the worst possible area and then radi radiate out from that school with really beautiful pavement and lots of green. And then what was really interesting is that the school would start to work as community center in the evenings. By day, it would teach kids. There would be computers for kids to do their, their homework. Um, they would get food. There were kitchens uh, connected to it. So you, you suddenly start to build the future of the children first you entertain the parents, you bring food to the neighborhood. But what was the most beautiful is that people got so inspired that that was done, that they started to fix their houses and they started to fix their gardens and they stopped throwing garbage everywhere. So it is really interesting that if you set a very good example in a very beautiful way, and I asked the people there, like, how on earth do you do this? This one school was in Medellin, um, top of the favelas in the mountains. 
And I said to them, how, how do you get this done? You know, like, honestly, we can't even get a school in, in the middle of Manhattan. And they were like, well, this is a collaboration between the universities, the mayors, and developers. And that's how they did it. And I think we, we don't brainstorm enough with uh, groups of people that have a ton to say. Actually, Nate mentioned it also. They have a ton to say, but are not heard. And I think we don't listen enough and we don't ask any good questions. <laughs> it's really important to ask the right questions rather than, you know, I did a, a, a think tank here after Sandy and I thought, oh, exciting. I'm Dutch, right? I know what to do with water <laughs> rain and flooding. <laughs> you know what question they asked us is like, what would you do with this little housing block in Brooklyn uh, when the flood was up to a story high? And, you know, you're going to save this little block. And I was like, what about building a dam out there? <laughs> Why would you bother with a little block? You need the front door, you know? And it's so, that's typically the problem here. We don't ask people to come up with the right solution. We give them so many restrictions mm -hmm. that the question is completely uninteresting. I mean, I was sitting that day there thinking we're just wasting our time. 80 super experienced architects ask the most dumb question ever. <laughs> and this is by, the, you know, this is by the governor, the mayor, city planning together, right? And the AIA. So these are smart people. And that's the only question they could come up with, that little Brooklyn block. Wow. No, that's that's a fantastic that's question. Yeah, it sounds about right. This sounds about right. They asked pretty silly questions, but they really look good. And they had all black and little round glasses. But no, that's that's fine. Do we, <laughs> we have an answer? How we uh, how do we broaden it a little bit, John? What do you think? Well, I think it's it's interesting how, how this how this conversation has unfolded, because what we're really getting at is the recreation of if we're talking about the United States is the creation of the commons, you know, beyond the public realm. Mm -hmm. Cities were founded with this idea of the commons, which everybody participated in. And I think that space, again, that we're sharing today is sort of part of that forum that needs to be created and we need to actualize it. You know, we spent, you know, what, from Pox, Pox Americana post, <laughs> post, uh, post Second World War, it's we've become a nation of consumers instead of a nation of, of you know, people that were taking action, let's say. And, and there's a variety of reasons for that. I don't think we have to go into what happened, but how do we recreate that? And I think forums and getting involved mm -hmm. and finding, uh, listening, being good listeners, trying to take in as much as we can about the city is, uh, and others that we live with, because we all live together. We create the city together. It's not something, uh, if you let it become created by others, then it is. But if you're, if you're a part of it, you have to be a part of it and you have to feel that your voice and other voices can have a meaningful, um, you know, influence on what's going to happen. I mean, you know, we've talked about the mayors, you know, maybe we need to reconceptualize the mayors, not just someone who's about economic right. uh, impact, but actually community impact. Mm -hmm. And I think just rephrasing like the red road that uh, Finca mentioned, you know, little things do pay dividends. You need to understand what your power can be. And we need to create that commons, whether there, it is a physical place or it's something that's manifested between people. I love the way you're talking about reframing it, because I think that's something as designers we do inherently, and we kind of need to share, right? And we need to share how we uh, view ourselves, but even more importantly, how we uh, portray the built environment, but also alluding back to earlier to the ecosystem idea, how the built environment is literally just a part of how we cities come to be. And so it, it'll take us away from the box that's been put upon designers and planners and really integrate it into how cities become, how they change, how they grow. A city is an organic thing, right? And so as we move forward, a term that's becoming more in vogue is future-proofing, right? How do we future-proof our cities, right? Uh, it's something, I won't blame it on academia, but we do see it there a lot. But uh, how do we future-proof our cities? Um, I'd like to hear the definition of future-proofing, uh, Winka. You know, I'll give you the, the softballs, right? But what is the definition, and uh, are we getting it right? Well, I think maybe two, two big things, I think. One is how can we make our buildings more hybrid? So the example of the school being a community um, building, you know, like as we, we don't have a lot of money for these things, the one of the solutions I think is to make the building so uh, beautiful and adaptable that they can be used for multiple things. For example, a stadium is a huge dead building. 
um, in the city normally, right? Because it's a huge wall around it. And then that's like never used except for when the games are on. Uh, what about if we do retail in the bottom to have the city be activated? Um, so I, that's one thing. I think buildings need to be hybrids and need to always um, be active part of the city and engage pedestrian level. And the other one is we need to green our cities because by the, you know, we're hardening the surfaces and the only reason why essentially we are flooding cities is because we don't have enough porous pavement, we don't have enough parks to absorb uh, the water, uh, and we don't have enough green roofs that also absorb um, stormwater. So I think by um, just being slightly more Maybe, I mean, I, you know, in a way you could say it should be probably a law that there is a certain amount of porous space to a city. We just did the Asian Games for um, the uh, Hangzhou Asian Games for this year. That's not next year, thanks to COVID. Um, but we made a, a park for the city where we, we had two things. One is a zero earth strategy. So the earth we dug out, we put on the buildings and we created green roofs. And the, the other one was kind of a sponge city model where um, we um, uh, made basically all porous pavement, re rebuilt wetlands, uh, make, made a lot of vegetation on the edges of the river and the wetlands to filter the water. Um, essentially just dealing with normal um, levels of maintaining water. And the other thing is we're gonna be short of water. So for example, Mexico City right now has containers under any courtyard or any public plaza that collect water, um, which they use for irrigation, gray water use. Mm -hmm. um, hence that the drinking water, our, our drinking water is really only used for drinking water, which really reduces drastically the pressure on our water, which, you know, as you know, South Africa has had several years where, I mean, someone could use three liters a day. I think I was there yeah. at that point which meant you can know you, you soak in under the shower and you rinse yourself off and that's it. You know, you can brush your teeth. And for the rest, you cannot use water. So I'll, I will go into other more tactile details, but uh, it is it is pretty uh, hair raising to, to actually go through that and to understand the amount of pressure we put on the environment. So I think um, these kind of small measures really should be standard for the city and we have to rewrite what cities cities are requiring and how they are going to get it done by you know asking developers to add these things under to add green roofs mm -hmm. as as we saw lead actually didn't only make better buildings or lead didn't only add green to buildings but it actually made developers build better buildings since we have lead which is kind of weird i never would have expected that but actually also got better architecture because of it so, you know, I think restrictions are always seen here as a negative. I actually think sometimes they are positive because they make people understand it's, you know, for their own benefit. And also it makes you part of the problem rather than always having to hear these terrible, scary stories of the climate this, climate that. No, you know, I mean, one thing I really liked about the governor in New York during COVID um, was that he walked us through the problems every morning at eight o'clock, right? He was sitting there saying, we're doing bad. This is what's going on. This is what we're going to do about it. We need you to do this and this and this in order to get the numbers down. And, that, and it made us part, as citizens, it made us part of the problem, but also helped us understand what we could do to solve it. And everyone was on board. I think we're underestimating just the power of that, just communicating what is the problem, what can we do to solve it, and how we're going to solve it. That was a great example of leadership, I thought. Excellent point, Winka. Uh, Nate, since you're coming from a, a very much a process-driven practice that really centers landscape design, but also makes it holistic, uh, how would you define future-proofing, uh, leveraging uh, Winka's points? I think I just want to add to to what she where you, where you started, Winka, and beyond buildings be needing to be hybrid, I think that infrastructure and public realm also needs to be hybrid. Um, like we, we, you know, you have, you know, the Detroit's a great example of it. You have this amazing network of streets that maybe don't all need to be used these days. And you have this extensive kind of network of infrastructure, if it's sewer, if it's power, if it's, so it's, but, I think we need to kind of 
rethink the way that infrastructure is is kind of deployed and kind of characterized in a city. Um, we we actually did a, a planning study in your former city in Houston, which was kind of looking at these major uh, power utilities that ran kind of north south through all of Houston, and kind of and how that those corridors could be actually turned into um, in in the public space. So. I think I'll leave it at that. I'll be short, but I think that, you know, and it's also kind of difficult to get engineers to kind of kind of wrap their heads around the notion of, <laughs> of, of utilities and infrastructure being hybrid. But um, I think it's a it, there's a great opportunity there. There's, there's a joke in there somewhere, Nate, about an engineer and architect walking to a bar. I can see it coming out of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do. I do appreciate that. We're going to synthesize both of them. I really appreciate the fact that uh, you talked about the way even here in Detroit uh, that we can revisit some of our public space and some of our arterials. I'll bring you to my next public meeting as a guest speaker. So thank you for that as well. Um, Would love to. Yeah. <laughs> no, so you, you, be careful what you ask for. Uh, I want to pivot, John. Well, we talk about future proofing, but also, uh, as we heard from both Winka and, uh, and Nate about uh, how we address uh, the hybrid nature of things moving forward, you've worked, done work in cities across the world. And as we look forward to getting past, um, uh, getting places to resiliency, I want to reintroduce the resiliency conversation. Uh, what are some of the baseline things that you look at from a reproach standpoint? If you're looking at doing a, a big, substantial project in cities that often can be very disparate, right? What you did in Shanghai is going to be much different than what you're doing here in Detroit. What are some of the early elements that you look to think about uh, when you're thinking about what the future of that city should look like? Well, I think when we're talking about sustainability as, as, a, as a departure point, um, you know, Right now, it's about mitigate, right? We're in a process of talking about carbon and how do we mitigate carbon, right? So from both the kind of embodied energy and what we construct, mm -hmm. right? That all the all the energy that goes into this chair, where it came from, all the materials, all of this could be represented by carbon that's in, embedded inside of it. And then the other thing is operational carbon. When we're talking, again, this is very building focused. So... So operational carbon is, you know, the load it takes to cool this room, right? There's carbon that is being used to cool this room, to broadcast. All of those things are what we call operational carbon. So when we start a new project, we like to begin with, you know, understanding all of those things and how can we, you know, orientate a project in a way that reduces solar heat gain, right? So you need less 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 cooling load to, to 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 bring it down or can we passively cool something can we do a, a night purge for instance where you open the windows but i think beyond that immediate thing i think one of the things about to me about resiliency is really about adaptation so if you get beyond buildings we want to start to adapt to our environment a little bit more there's a push and pull i mean we've talked about it as as an organism or a system of ecologies you know, what are the, what, and again, this comes back to values. Like, what are our values? Like, you know, animals are just in, as important to this and plants to this conversation as buildings and people. And so, again, if we go to the water issue, I think this is probably the biggest one in terms of adaptation. You know, are we going to wall it off? Are we going to live with it? You know, floating cities has been something that's had a lot of press traction. Or, uh, you know, um, are we going to move away from it? You know, in 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 areas where you know uh, um, sea level rise is 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 apparent. You know, we're still building in Miami. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, a, a good investment? I mean, I love the city, but you know, are we? Is that the right place to put our resources and to spend that carbon? Because we live in a finite thing. And I think all of this comes back to, I think what we've been talking about is how do you actualize any of that to to people? And so. Again, another way to identify these things is using the data points and the technology that we have today. All of a sudden, we're in this space where you can see how many rooftops in Detroit are good for solar, which I, I really love that part of the, the Detroit website. That, wow, that's awesome that you guys you know map that out or where heat islands are affecting different people in the city. You know, those are all things that we can take information or measuring the air quality. You know, just this morning, there was a, a gentleman on, on a public radio talking about his company here in Detroit called Just Air mm -hmm. and how important that is uh, to the environment. Like, how can we, you know, build systems uh, to, to, you know, 
also you know, control things. Like maybe we don't need another industrial site in this place because there's already enough. Or how do we control or manage? I think we're, we're coming into an era of more management, mm -hmm. right? Because even the growth of a city, if it's untapped, what does the future generation have, right? Like in terms of the housing crisis, can anybody live anywhere? Because we've already developed so much of it. So I think using technology, using data points, and sort of having a holistic understanding of that ecosystem or that ecology uh, that we live in, you know, is something that we need to kind of get towards quicker. And, and that way we can adapt to and be a part of that change uh, for the better. So I, I appreciate the part about adaptation and how we're moving into, you know, how do we address uh, our need for our natural resources? How do we manage that? How do we, our cities change? One of the biggest challenges we have here locally, right, is we have a city that was designed to accommodate literally three times as many people as are here right now. Right. right? Um, and then you juxtapose that with a New York City that is, you know, a percentage of the size of Detroit physically and has, you know, over 12 times the number of people in that location. Uh, when we look at Detroit, since we're here, right? Yep. Um, and we're trying to grow this city and we're trying to grow it equitably, but we also wanted to ensure that it's sustainable. Um, what are some of the ideas? I, I got three super smart people up here, right? Uh, that know how to use architectonic in a sentence, right? So how do we use these kinds of ideas? What kind of things can we do equitably uh, to help grow uh, the city of Detroit? And I will um, shamelessly go back to this recording uh, for my department and use all of it later. So uh, uh, let's go with Nate. Nate, I know you got some ideas for me. Uh, <laughs> I think whatever, whatever city you're in, the important thing are the people. And, yeah. and I think it becomes really challenging in a place like, well, there are different challenges in Detroit than there are in a place like New York. But um, I, I think that we have to kind of do everything, if, you know, to, to, you know, put the people that are, especially the folks that have stayed in Detroit and are still living there, like they are priority one. And mm -hmm. I think then kind of going back to that notion of like hybrid infrastructure and hybrid public realm and hybrid buildings, we, we, we don't completely reinvent. We, you know, you look to what's there as like, as your kind of roadmap to, to where development can happen and things that can be modified and changed. Um, so again, that sounds like, it, as the landscape architect again, it's like uber pragmatic. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I think if, if we actually just try to use what's there and be smart about how we invest money and how we, we kind of reinterpret uh, roadways and infrastructure, I think it, it it will make for a better city. Um, and then it's like we, and we do need moments in the city and, and moments in development where there is kind of, we kind of bolster a civic pride. Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe just a little kind of, that's like icing on the cake or, you know, um, but I do, I do think it's important. Um, so again, it's like you, you have this kind of very bottom up approach and you have, and then you kind of have this high level kind of moments that, that bring people together. Um, Excellent. Excellent. John, you got some ideas? Uh, yeah, I feel like I think I think um, for me, coming back to the city um, and sort of seeing, you know, I've been away from the, the amazing changes that have happened. I remember kind of poo pooing the idea that the stadiums were going to come downtown and, <laughs> and especially as an architect and I let, you know, and also as a, a you know, a, a Tigers fan. Um, but, but, but I definitely think bringing, again, bringing some, consolidating some of what's happening to two areas is a way to stimulate growth. And I think we mentioned, you know, the idea about, you know, how do you keep retail going after the pandemic, right? You need footfalls, you need a constituency in, in an environment. Um, you know, clearly the improvements that are happening are benefiting a lot of people, but I also think, you know, strategically planning out some of the some of the wonderful things that have been happening in the city is important because as you mentioned you know new york manhattan everything's consolidated mm -hmm. into one area um and and there is there's a lot of benefit to having a denser a denser core uh, for a variety of reasons in terms of what that what that footprint is of a, of a city um you know and as detroit has sort of you know 
um, gone back to nature in certain areas. You know, how do we, how do we, you know, we have people that live there that are, that it is their neighborhood and we, you know, we need to be a part of that. But I also think you have to have, you know, again, I'm talking about this as someone who loves cities. So there's, there's definitely something about consolidating some of those resources and, and, in, and improving strategically areas so they can come up and then everything are, you know, around that it can, it can, it'll come up as well. I think it's, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So I think that's gotta be part of the, 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 the scenario. Um, and the reason why I say that is it feels like there's a lot of things happening mm. all over the place. And, 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 and those are all great things, but does it, mm -hmm. is it a strategy that's effective for success? Uh, that would be, I mean, hopefully it is, but to me, it, it, I'm a little nervous about it. That's more than fair. Winka, what's your perspective? How do we grow the city? Well, I totally agree with um, activating downtown, as you might have already understood, but I was thinking about something called um, happiness index. You know, we in the US, we don't really think about happiness much, I think, or talk about it. Maybe we do think about it, but we don't talk about it. I think we should talk about it. What makes people happy? Why would they move to downtown? And I, I was thinking we really need to, if we, so happiness factor is actually a happiness index is something that actually exists. US is at the 16th spot. I just looked it up. Uh, first spot is Finland. And you know the difference, and then you have Iceland and the Netherlands and Denmark. So you know why that is. That is because um, these cities have no commuting time. There is very little commuting time. Commuting makes people extremely stressed and unhappy because traffic, pollution, they stand still, they, they come to work, they're already exhausted, they get up really early. So I think if you reduce the commuting times, it means you have to build social housing in downtown. No mm -hmm. stadiums, thank you very much. Sorry, I don't agree. <laughs> stadiums are dead monsters. I agree. They take a ton of space. They do nothing by day. The three <laughs> events in a year that they have, they just overload the city center and there's a lot of mess and chaos and the whole <laughs> city around it hates it. You really need to build social housing, I think, downtown and make it actually affordable and then add retail, schools. It's a normal city plan, right? Retail, schools, police stations, like get downtown inhabited. That is what ultimately saved Manhattan from bankruptcy, right? Mm -hmm. when, when our favorite, not so favorite in, in how he did it, I think, Giuliani, but ultimately what he did get done is that it became safe and people started to um, invest to live here again, and people started moving downtown and uptown, I mean, as in Manhattan. And the moment people live there, you have tax money, you have retail, they pay taxes. That's, what, that's the only thing you need to get a city going. You need people in it. And I agree with Nate, people are the first one where you start. So if you don't have people in your city, it's not going to work because you have no taxes, you have no nothing, no, no, no shops, no libraries, no whatever. So first you get people downtown, then the rest will follow and, and incentivize them, you know, say you lose your commuting time, you work, live in the same spot, you reduce commuting time, we give benefits in the housing, you know, whatever we save there, we put into housing. You have to come up with a with a really good scheme. I did as my thesis in uh, architecture school, I did a funny study on uh, the black market. And I studied how any big in, um, change had happened in the world. Like how did cities change? And it was the boulevards and Haussmann, right? Haussmann's boulevards in Paris uh, um, and many other events. I won't lecture you on that, but like all of them had a few things in common. And it was one was someone with a good idea Second was there was an amazing, some sort of interesting way of financing it. And three, it was adding to the, the quality of lifestyle of the persons in it. So if you have those three factors, you are going to have an absolutely perfect downtown, but it starts with really affordable social housing, I think. So I definitely appreciate that. It'll make my life much simpler. Uh, there is a number of, this is quite a bit of dialogue online. So people are, seem to be very vested in this. We've got questions and commentary and they're on the screen and I'm old and can't read them. So I just want to be <laughs> honest about yeah. that. So I would love to have, you know, some dialogue with those questions. Uh, 
What's the best question, Ivana? I, I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't quite read it, so I apologize. Yeah, so let me read one of these questions. I'll help you out here. <laughs> uh, so can you provide practical examples of how process thinking has been used to develop urban spaces? Did you guys hear that? All right, there you go. Whoever asked that, great question. Who wants to jump in? I, I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, when you have something that's uh, like a PUD or a Euler process, sometimes those have been very successful, uh, uh, depending on where they've been done. I definitely think that uh, to bring it back to the Dutch, I think what they do with their with their developments and the constraints they put on developers is really an enlightened process where you have to have mixed income for every, I believe every, you know, Binka could probably make, make sure I'm right on this, but I think everything has to be mixed income. So it's not, uh, you know, what's happening around Central Park, for instance, where you have, uh, San, uh, you know, like Italian power cities where it's all the rich people looking down on the, mm -hmm. the peasants kind of thing. Um, but the, you know, so I think those types of strategies are really you know, in the context of, of the United States are probably important to think about. Because uh, again, those towers downtown were supposed to have some, or on the park had to have a low income units, but because of a, a gap in that, in that code, they could build them in the Bronx and it was just as equal. Yeah. So again, you're creating, you're, you're doing good development and it's, but is the heart in the right place there? And, and again, that comes down to the values that we have as, 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 as urban, an urban population. You know, is that an acceptable formula for success? I mean, now you can't live there in some of those places. People are getting priced out of cities because of these things. And then who's, who's gonna do the work? Yeah. You know, if the, all, the, all the, you know, <laughs> the, again, the city needs everybody. It's not like, it's not a castle, you know, and then everybody's outside of it. It's got to be um, built together. It's a great point. Other practical examples from Nate or uh, Winka? Yeah, I think I think I totally agree with you know it's team thinking. So you, it process process sounds so like oh it's easy. There is a recipe for it, and that will solve everything. Ultimately, I think you know it really takes someone with money, someone with power on the government level, and someone with creativity in order to do anything. So the more we can think out of the box in how to create each, these theme, these teams, uh, the better we get, I think. And that's, uh, that's I think, uh, just an easy and simple solution. The process will be, you know, I think the, there's a question about energy. You know, it's, it's I think what, what was just mentioned, the idea that, you know, the, the government needs to, have more um, restrictions on developers, I think is totally true. We should require a certain amount of green space, certain amount of offset of the carbon footprint, certain amounts of uh, mixed income housing, um, you know, add, uh, we have a huge lack of kindergartens and schools, add a school to the building. And these kind of things are very easy to require and ultimately doesn't leave the developer without money, just maybe not as much. Understood. Um, um, I'm going to take this in, in a wildly different direction. Um, and just an example of process thinking and how we use process thinking in public meetings. Um, one of the tools that we use are fairly crude, but very large models. Um, <laughs> and we had this reputation in New York for a long time of being the ones that made the ugly models, but they were they were done so really intentionally. And that's because we, we let people stand around a model. It, feels, it facilitates conversation. It's like most people aren't trained to read a plan, let alone a map anymore, now that we have maps on our phones. But the wonderful thing about the, the, the kind of crude model made out of paper and cardboard was that we could tear it up in front of somebody if someone had an idea, or we could, we could rip something off the model and we could move it somewhere else. And it was kind of, and this isn't patting ourselves on the back, but it was like our way of saying, your idea is as important as our idea. And look, we can make a change this quickly um, and, we're, and we're listening to you. So I realized, um, sorry to kind of turn 180 there, but I think it's, um, it's been something that, that, that we've really kind of enjoyed having conversations around. And I think, I wish, I wish more people would do it. 
Well, Nate, you uh, maybe unwittingly. Uh, that, go ahead, academic. Yes, Winka, what you got? We got. I got to close, but go ahead. Come on. No, I just want to quickly say I love that, Nate. I think that's fantastic, and I totally agree. People fall in love with the model because they understand it. But the other thing we did once was uh, for Bogota, we put a website up called My Ideal City, and we asked two thousand questions, I think, and we started to calibrate. So, and people would answer like. They were so excited. So this is this is basically questions for anyone in the city, right? They they would give, you know, what what is the favorite spot or what is your favorite spot to put a park? And they would put the spot and they would make ideas and design the park. And what we did is, of course, you don't answer every personal email, but we would tell them that we derive trends from it and really answer it in the sense that we'd see it happening in the city in certain ways. And we would then po post that back. Like, hey, you guys, uh, 20, we had 80,000 followers, I think, you know, 20,000 people said a park in that area, we gave it to the mayor, this is the plan, we're talking about it, then, then, then. And it was super fun, because people actually felt heard, and it was a great way for them to start taking care of their city, and really wanting to be part of it. And that is the last that is the last word. Winka nailed it. Uh, people really want to be heard to be a part of the city. And so all of our process thinking as we're thinking about the future of the cities really has to be uh, inclusive of the residents that are living there and are uh, promoting it. And so I want to give let's let's give Winka, Nate and John a hands. Great, great group. Great conversation. We had an hour and plus fly by <laughs> and before. Uh, Ivana throws tomatoes at my very nice suit. We're going to wrap it up and give you guys a break. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.